This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Struck Human rights China issues today. are still... The term Ubuntu. Of the Alien and Sedition Act. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Ho Franklin Center. It is virtually impossible to think about the rise of Barack Obama's political fortunes without also thinking about the emergence of social media. Today on Left of Black, we talk with William Jelani Cobb, author of In the Substance of Hope, a new book about Barack Obama's rise. And we also will talk with Bassie Ickpe, performance artist, poet, satirist, who will talk about her life on Twitter. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left of Black. Good afternoon, and you are watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and we're joined this afternoon by Professor William Jelani Cobb of Rutgers University in the Department of History and Africana Studies. Jelani Cobb is the author of The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress, To the Break of Dawn, a freestyle on hip-hop aesthetics, and The Devil and Dave Chappelle. How are you doing this afternoon, Jelani? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, you know, you spent uh, the earlier part of this year uh, in Russia. Um, talk yeah. a little bit about your Russian trip. Um, you know, what, what were you hoping to accomplish? You know, what kind of experiences did you have? You know, are you going to write about them, you know, yeah. you know at length? I, I uh, taught as a Fulbright um, scholar there at Moscow State University. Um, and, you know, I applied to, to go to Russia because I wanted to get out of my comfort zone yeah. and wanted to do something that was different. You know, I, I kind of, you know, I mean, teaching is always challenging. There are always new things, you know, that you can learn from your students and from your peers. But I also felt like I wanted to do something that would make me really stretch. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wanted to teach in a different environment. I, I mean, and so that was, how, that was how I wound up applying. Yeah. And I mean, there's a whole history of, of particularly progressive Negroes um, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. Russia. You know, did you feel compelled at all while you were there to kind of connect um, to this broader black radical tradition? Um, I did. I did. You know, I, and that was on, a, on multiple levels. One, it was in the archives, you know, and actually looking at some of the experiences that people had there. Uh, and another was connecting with people who, uh, you know, either studied or in some cases were descendants, uh, you know, of, of African Americans who had gone to the Soviet Union uh, during the 30s and 40s, you know, to escape you know, Jim Crow and, and uh, labor exploitation and all the things that we're so familiar with, you know, that happened to black people in the 20th century. Your latest book, uh, The Substance of Hope, uh, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress, um, you know, you're one of the, what seems like thousands of books, uh, I know it's not that many, <laughs> no. you know, that was published on right. the Obama phenomenon. Um, and, you know, all of them had a certain kind of expectation. Um, you know, it's now, you know, two years, almost two years, four years since, two years, four years since the election, you know, two years since the inauguration. Have you been surprised at all, one, at the way that Obama has governed, um, mm -hmm. you know, given what you were able to find out about Obama in your own research and, and find out about, you know, the, the black political body, you know, mm -hmm. in your research. And have you at all been surprised that the, the animus, you know, that has been directed at him, you know, in many different guises, you know, over these last two years? Yeah, um, in, in kind of in order, I wasn't surprised. I haven't been really surprised by the way that he's governed. Um, I've been pleased with some things and displeased with, you know, other things, but they were pretty much consistent with the way that he, uh, you know, expressed himself in uh, The Audacity of Hope. Uh, so if we go back to that book, we kind of see, you know, what his policy priorities are, how he sees the world, and, you know, what his political perspective is. Uh, that said, you know, I was, you know, I thought he did a good job by making health care one of the first, you know, things that were on his agenda, even though people didn't get everything uh, that they wanted in that bill. Uh, but uh, I think what we didn't recognize is that a lot of people would have just sidestepped <laughs> that issue yeah, yeah. Or, or punted or punted on that issue, you know, <coughs> or three or something like that. Uh, and uh, by the same time, the escalation in Afghanistan, you know, I, dis you know, I disagreed with, you know, vehemently. At this, but it was consistent with what he what he pretty much outlined. Now, in terms of the animus, uh, I don't think that there's anything necessarily 
unexpected about it. Uh, and so when I look at the, the anti-government rhetoric that we see, you know, being, you know, promulgated on, you know, Fox News and, you know, other outlets and, you know, the rise of the Tea Party and so on, it's in some ways consistent with what we were seeing in the 90s with Bill Clinton. If you recall the, uh, uh, the bombing of the Oklahoma City uh, building, the Alfred P. Murrah building in 1995, uh, came after, you know, three years of very heated rhetoric about uh, the excesses of government and government encroaching on people's freedom. And you know, when we saw the people out protesting the, uh, the health care bill with, with guns, uh, it was, you know, reminiscent of what we were seeing a, a decade and some change earlier. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. You're watching Left the Black. We're here with Rutgers University professor William Jelani Cobb, author of the new book, The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress. Um, you know, you were a delegate um, to the Democratic Convention in 2008, and, and you wrote about how excited, exciting you, excited you were about that process, about being engaged in the process in a way you hadn't been engaged before. Do you f still feel that same level of engagement or excitement as you think about, you know, how things are going to progress in 2012? Excitement, no. Um, but I think it's been replaced by, you know, something that's kind of a more realistic perspective on what, you know, was going on in, in uh, you know, American politics right now. Uh, and, you know, a friend of mine, Ed McClellan, who wrote a book uh, about also one of those million books on Barack Obama, uh, he has a an analogy that he likes to to use, in which he says the the campaign was the engagement, and this is the marriage. And yeah. so, saying that it, it's not that same level of uh, anticipation and excitement. You know, that said, there are still moments where you know some mundane aspect of you know the office of the presidency, and I'll see the person who's executing it. I'll see the person who's standing behind that podium with the seal of the United States on it and the office of the president and recognize that that's a black man and it still trips me out, you know, at random yeah, moments, yeah. you know. Like you're watching uh, the episode of Dave Chappelle or something like exactly, Richard Pryor. Or exactly, something, right. you yeah. know, uh, and, you know, recognizing that kind of, you know, people who are children now will not really notice anything unusual about it. So yeah, in that sense, it is. Now, in terms of actual the actual engagement um, one of the things that I've tried to do is, you know, view things from a realistic perspective. Uh, I think that uh, the expectations for Barack Obama were so astronomical that there was nowhere to go but down after Inauguration Day. Uh, and, you know, I've still tried to see when we saw that gap in the number of, you know, progressives and Democrats who came out to vote uh, in the midterms, you know, I thought that that was a really ominous sign that perhaps we had, you know, forgotten that you know, it was actually activism uh, that enabled right, right. Obama to get into the office. Right. And it would be activism that would keep him there. And, and to be honest, it would be activism that, and engagement that would keep him honest while he's there. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's been the message we've gotten. I think one of the things that, that's refreshing about your book um, is that it gets away from the kind of standard beltway talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you talk about that kind of activist community that was gauge, engaged in Obama's campaign in 2008, you know, they are the folks who are least interested, right, mm -hmm. in, in this kind of beltway talk. But that said, um, you know, there's been a kind of standard narrative, you know, in mainstream corporate media around this notion that somehow, you know, folks were speaking back. You know, I'm here in North Carolina. Um, where Heath Schuler, you know, is thinking about challenging, you know, Nancy Pelosi on the idea that the Democratic Party has ventured too far to the left, right. um, and the Tea Party was somehow a confirmation of that. Um, what strikes me is how invisible um, a left is in this conversation, right? You know, right. part of the lack of support, you know, we, they keep talking about independence. Not all those independents went right. You know, some of those independents were independents on the left, right, right. Who, were, who were critical of kind of the mainstreaming of the Democratic Party. You know, what do you think is, is at this kind of difficulty and mainstream media in particular being able to find where a left critique exists of, of Barack Obama? Right, well, one of the things that, that Obama said, you know, rhetorically during the campaign that we found to be, you know, interesting or appealing uh, was that he wanted to change the tone of politics and he wanted to uh, d decrease the partisan rancor that was in Washington. 
And, you know, he also campaigned to change. He wanted to make substantial changes in the country. And, you know, that was completely unrealistic. And you know, I think I knew that at the time, uh, but it wasn't kind of at the front of my mind, that, that social change, you know, legislative change, political change has always uh, or, or very typically come with increased partisan bitterness. Right. Uh, and so it, was, it wasn't something that you could have. <laughs> now, in terms of the left, one of the things I think that's been stunning is uh, the way that the right has out-organized, I think, the left in the past two years, yeah. uh, especially when that campaign was characterized by organizational discipline. Right. Uh, and so both from the administration, you know, and David Pluff, you know, being with, you know, organizing for America, and you're thinking that this would be a, a kind of external arm that the president would be able to use uh, for his for activism purposes, that you'd have an activist president, and that hasn't happened. But even groups that are kind of outside that. So, for instance, when we saw the debate about healthcare being defined by death panels and right. Uh, right. you know all kinds of wild allegations, you know where were uh, you know the cancer survivors <laughs> to to march on the mall and say right. if it hadn't been for right. my healthcare policy, I wouldn't be here. Um, or you know where were the the people who had uh, lost their homes, you know, because right. they, they got sick and, you know, couldn't afford to pay their bills. Uh, and so that narrative never came out. And it's been one of the things that I think uh, is stunning and really become a defining element of like our politics right now. Yeah, the inability of Obama really to kind of celebrate whatever successes he's had, you know, right. in, in this context. And, and, and some significant ones. Yeah, that. absolutely. Um, I'm Mark Anthony Neal. You're watching Left of Black. We're here with Professor William Jelani Cobb of Rutgers University author of the new book, The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama, and the Paradox of Progress. At the end of the book, you, you use a great metaphor um, around you know, American culture and baseball and really this kind of connection between uh, Barack Obama and Jackie Robinson. You, mm -hmm. you, know, you mentioned that Jackie Robinson's first hit back you know, hits this triple, um, mm -hmm. and the triple takes on so much more significance you know, right. than, than any other base hit by anybody in any game. And, and rather than talk about Barack Obama's Jackie Robinson moment being after um, his inauguration, um, you go back to Iowa. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I remember reading, it, you know, you wrote a great deal, particularly on your blog, American Exception, um, about this notion of, you know, if Barack Obama could win in Iowa, right. um, that, that that was the biggest thing he could do because it, it would convince white America um, that he was a viable candidate, and more importantly, it would depend, it would also convince black America that he right. was a viable candidate right. because white people would vote for him. Um, you know, not that you are, you know, an interpreter of everything that happens in black life, you know, in 2010. You know, where do you think, you know, that the black community or black communities are in terms of thinking about Barack Obama at this point in time? I mm -hmm. mean, you use this great, you know, uh, quote from, from James Baldwin. Right, this notion of t uh, black political leaders having to tell white right. people to hurry up, but also <laughs> telling black folks black to, wait. to wait. Right, yeah. <laughs> right exactly. Uh, you know, one of the things is, is important to point out too, you know, for this conversation is that Jackie Robinson hit a triple in his first at bat you yeah. know, for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and then immediately lapsed into a slump. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, he, he came out of it and you know went on to you know become the the Hall of Fame hey, player right, that right. that he that he is, but. Um, you know, there was that period after, immediately after, where people were wondering if this really was going to work out. Well, he tried to figure out what he was, what he got himself into, uh, and so that metaphor may be apt, more apt than we knew, than I yeah, knew at the time. Yeah. Um, in terms of activists, <coughs> you know, there's been, you know, this dynamic where people have pointed out in the media. Uh, he has an over 90% approval rating, you know, among black people and, and so on. And, you know, some black critics have pointed that out, have are pointed to that and said that African Americans have been not, you know, suitably critical right. um, of the president. But I, I see something else when I see that. I think that he has that 90% uh, approval rating among African Americans precisely because of the unfairness of the, the type of criticism he's, yeah. he's, uh, right. he's faced. Right. Uh, and so because you have people running around saying that he wasn't born in this country, calling him a communist, um, uh, and I think especially the visuals of seeing people running around with shotguns at those right. town hall meetings, right. uh, it, it made, I think, a kind of defense reflex and in, in black America kick into gear uh, and, and kind of close ranks around him. I suspect that if you were to go to the barbershop, 
you would have a much different kind of conversation than what you see in the polls. Uh, people concerned, you know, has, has enough stimulus money gone into these inner city communities? Uh, these uh, wars in Afghanistan um, and, you know, still remaining in Iraq, you know, what is the, the effect of that on the economy? Uh, you know, this job joblessness rate, which is for African Americans still double right. you know, the white right. average. Right. Uh, and so I think these are real substantive issues that people have concerns about. Uh, but there's no political room, like the oxygen has been taken out of the room by, uh, you know, the firebrand rhetoric that we've seen from people on the right. So what's next for you, Jelani? Um, you know, you, you have a wide breadth of interest, you know, in terms of, you know, the work that you've done on kind of black radicalism in the past, um, you know, the work that you've done in terms of looking at popular culture. I'm thinking about your book on Dave Chappelle, um, you know, in particular. Um, and, and of course, the work that you've done on hip hop. And I think all of us are feeling a little weary these days about talking about hip hop anymore. Right. Um, but what's next for you in terms of your, of your work? Uh, I have two projects that um, you know com intend to complete in 2011, uh, and one is uh, a study on anti-communism in the Cold War, uh, and the other is uh, a book on 9/11, uh, which I've been working on you know, off and on for some time too. So uh, those are the next two things coming down the pipe. Okay. You're watching Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We've been joined this afternoon by William Jelani Cobb, author of Barack Obama, The Paradox of Progress, The Substance of Hope. Um, also the author of To the Break of Dawn, A Freestyle on Hip Hop Aesthetics and The Devil and Dave Chappelle and other essays. Thanks for joining us this afternoon, Jelani. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Be good. I do, I use Facebook and Twitter. Um, Twitter more to find out um, just kind of what my friends are up to, follow them around, they use it uh, with Foursquare a lot so I know where they are. And um, I also use it because I follow a lot of uh, big name comedians, they have little hilarious thoughts during the day which I like to get. And I use Facebook to find out events that are happening in the community, uh, share funny videos with my friends, things like that, so yeah, I, I use both um, quite a bit. Well, you know, I really don't use social media the way most people use social media. What I've been trying to do is take uh, this public television media and turn it into my social media and put my ideas and my types of uh, music, etc., out there for people to view it on public television stations. Uh, yes, I do use social media. Uh, I'm a big fan of the internet and the interwebs in general. Um, I do have like a Facebook account. Back in the day I had a MySpace account. Um, but actually the type of social media that I use the most is Twitter. Um, I like it because people send a lot of links, a lot of news information, a little bit of personal stuff, but more so it's um, stories about, uh, you know, like television, film, whatever stuff that I like, uh, rather than um, a bunch of pictures of like their baby two minutes after it was born, which I've seen too much of on Facebook, so I'm not really a huge Facebook fan. And, I guess I use social media more to find out information um, about stuff that I like rather than real personal connections. We're back here on Left the Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and we are joined by a special guest, Bassi Ikpi, spoken word poet, performance artist, satirist. I could think of many things. And, and I'll just start with my own introduction to Bassi's work. Um, having become part of the Twitterati um, earlier this year. Um, one of the people who struck me as just doing some amazing things on a regular basis in terms of commentary, on terms of this kind of interesting self-deprecating attitude, in terms of humor, you know, was Bassie. Um, and, and this whole idea of Bassie's world. Um, I want to talk a little bit, start to talk a little bit about your, your blog, um, Bassie's World. Um, tales of an underachieving overachiever. <laughs> Explain for us a little bit. Um, I think that uh, I had a, you know, when I was in elementary school and high school, people expected a lot. 
And then I got to college and completely didn't do any of that. <laughs> but I have high uh, aspirations and expectations of myself. Um, but I think I'm kind of comfortable sort of creating my own lane. So I'm not doing quite what I want to do, but I'm doing enough. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's so fascinating about your story, you're born in Nigeria and, and your family moves to Stillwater, Oklahoma. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, what kind of culture shock was that, you know, growing up? Uh, crazy. I mean, I was four and a half when we moved and um, my parents were both in college uh, and, and Stillwater is a college town. Uh. So I went from, you know, a, a black country to a white people in the country. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's difficult because I really enjoyed it. Um, looking back, I had a hard time while I was there, but looking back, I think it contributes to the kind of personality I have. I have a very small town personality, um, despite the fact that, you know, seven and a half years in, in New York and, you know, the last, gosh, 14, 15 years altogether, um, 18, oh my gosh, I'm old, 18 years uh, in the DC area. You mentioned that, you know, when you were younger, your father gave you a copy of Nikki Giovanni's Eagle Tripping. Um, yes. And how that you love the swagger um, of the poem. Not necessarily the words, but, but the swagger of it. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about your own swag. Um, <laughs> you, you Do know. I have swag? Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, you strike me as being fairly uniquely suited to be able to do that, you know, rather comfortably. I mean, you do that fairly regularly on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> my swag. I don't know. I, I, think that, I think that one of the things that I, what I like about myself um, is that I think that I sort of, I'm confident and I know who mm. I am and I know my purpose. But I'm also not flawless, and I'm, and I'm so fine talking about my flaws mm -hmm. and, 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 and being open with the things that I go through and the things that are embarrassing that, you know, people really shouldn't talk about, but, you know, I'll talk about because it, it humanizes all of us, you yeah. know? So, um, and I think that based on the nature of my work and the fact that, um, you know, I'm, I write and, I, you know, I've been on, you know, Deaf Poetry Jam or whatever, people mm -hmm. seem to want mm -hmm. to put writers and poets and quote unquote public figures on a pedestal mm -hmm. and I just want to remove myself from that pedestal and like you know like don't do that like uh, you're probably more successful than I am or make more money or you know don't trip over your own feet like I do so I just want to you know level things I don't think that anybody should be on a pedestal I sure as heck don't want to stay there when somebody puts me up there I just climb on down. You're watching Left to Black. I'm Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with writer and satirist Bassie Ikpe, uh, one of the leading lights of what I'll call the Black Twitterati. Um, if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to Twitter, because you know, you know, seeing you tweet on a regular basis, and of course reading your work, and, and the way that you, you know, really seamlessly integrate. Um, your writing into this Twitter world, you know, it's almost as if Twitter was ra was waiting for somebody like you. Uh, you know, that, that, that it was created for, for someone like you in mind. Um, so talk a little about, you know, about your own engagement and how you think about Twitter and how you use it at this point in time. Um, I love Twitter. Uh, I, I had a love-hate relationship with it when I first got on it because um, for somebody with the kind of mind I have, I'm neurotic and I, <laughs> I'm always thinking about something. Um, I had a tendency to put too much out there. And uh, what I learned to do is sort of scale back and save some stuff for, you know, my personal friends. Um, I love Twitter because I've met some extraordinary people on Twitter. Mm. And I, I love how it levels the playing field where I'm talking to you, who I've admired for years. And I'm talking to, you know, different people um, and we all have the same conversation. Yeah. Uh, I hope to use Twitter um, the way that I used my original website back when I started again to level the playing field, yeah. um, to make myself accessible um, and to have people, you know, be able to have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And uh, I love to talk and <laughs> Thus you and, love to tweet. <laughs> yeah, you know, and like it's, it's, it's funny because I spend so much time alone um, because, you know, writers, where are we gonna go? Um, so it's, I feel like there are people in a room with me and I can talk to them when I want to and then I can get back to work when I want to get back to work. Um, so all the little things in my head that 
ordinarily would be a 90 minute phone call to somebody, mm -hmm. I just tweet. <laughs> One of the ways I know that we connected on Twitter is that you've written, you know, very, very beautifully and with much insight about your son, uh, you know, who you refer to as Boogie. Um, a lot of your, your regular column on My Brown Baby, again, kind of a parenting thing. Um, you know, talk about, you know, how you balance, you know, being this writer, um, you know, being this public figure, and at the same time, you know, having to be reminded of the role that you play as a parent. Um, and, and then also making that role as a parent part of who you are as a public person. Well, um, I have no choice with the, with the son that I have. He doesn't <laughs> care who or what and where I was <laughs> yesterday as long as he gets his noodles and, you know, whatever. Um, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a maternal person, yeah. if I could say that. I, I, I never really wanted to be a parent. I was never the child that you know, dreamed of marriage and kids. I mean, and how'd, how'd you put it, too much six-inch heels, right? Yeah, I was, I was way too much six-inch heels and globe-trotting. Um, but, you know, my son came as a, as, a, as a surprise. And what I realized was that I needed to parent the way that I knew how to. Um, definitely putting him into consideration and, and the type of man that I want him to grow into and the type yeah. of person I want yeah. him to be. Um, but I had to do that on my terms. Like, I'm not a cookie baking, you know, uh, you know, cupcake person. My sister is, you know what I mean? So she <laughs> takes care of that. My mother's an excellent cook, so she takes care of that. So I make sure he gets what he needs. And with me, we just sort of hang out and and talk and uh, crack jokes. Like, he's he's hilarious, you know what I mean? And, um, and we just, we have a lot of fun, but he also understands that I'm his mother and He's probably the only, I'm probably the only person that he listens to on a consistent basis because he's very, very strong-willed. Surprise again. Um, but he knows that when I tell him something, that I'm telling it to him because it's something he needs to hear. Yeah. So he does listen to me. And I think that, that that's a wonderful dynamic that I've sort of created with him that I hope continues um, as he gets older. And then, you know, what you brought up bringing up, baby, um, bringing up Boogie with that. Um, I don't know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I, I, I want to sort of, you know, chronicle the journey and then yeah. have other people because I have a lot of questions I'm like, okay, he yeah. asked for a Barbie and he asked for a white Barbie. What do I do? You know what I mean? So um, <laughs> I just want to get help from as many people as <laughs> possibly can. That's funny. Um, you had some words for Tyler Perry. Um, oh, let me say this. You had some words for Tyler Perry's adaptation of For Colored Girls. Um, you know, when all is said and done, you know, what's your thought about the movie and, and you know, where do we go from here? I didn't like the movie. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that it diminished what Inazaki Shange had done with the original work. Now, now had, had you performed, had you done performances of the original work before? Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've done, not the whole thing. Um, I, 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 I've got the Bo Willie Brown poem memorized and mm -hmm. I've, um, you know, I, I perform different segments of it at different times. I used to close all my shows with 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 a uh, with a lady in red poem, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it was just for me, it was such an empowering empowering piece of work. And leaving Tyra Perry's movie, I felt deflated. I didn't feel empowered. And the way that he arranged the poems in order to, um, you know, say certain things <coughs> politically, I found offensive because. There was no joy in being a colored girl yeah. um, in Tyler Perry's movie, and I don't think that was the right thing for him to have done. Um, I think that I'm glad Itazaki's work is out there, but I think mm -hmm. that more than just the work, as far as writing goes, is the sentiment behind it. So if you reduce a writer to just the words you want to hear, then you're reducing them to to pretty much nothing. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, and I feel great. like that's what he yeah. did. Um, I'm glad I made a lot of money. I'm glad it introduced people to Nozaki's work. Uh, but I wish that the the movie showed or highlighted more joyful, celebra uh, celebratory, you know, moving past the mountain type moments that that that, that we as uh, black people and black women have to do on a daily basis. You're watching Left to Black. We're here with Bassie Ikpe, uh talking about a range of things. Uh, you're working on a memoir now, um, yes. Too Cute to Be Crazy. You want to talk a little <laughs> bit? You want, you want to share just a little bit? Uh, You're not of, supposed uh, to say the title. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, Too Cute to Be Crazy is a memoir of my, uh, of my life with uh, mental illness from when I first mm -hmm. started noticing that there wasn't something really right, uh, for lack of a better 
And you're a mental health advocate, right? You, that's the kind of work that you yeah. do on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. Um, d d yeah definitely. Uh, for the last six years since I was diagnosed, um, when I realized that people, especially black people, were really talking about it, and I realized that I had a unique position um, from where I was standing to, to sort of invite people to have the conversation without accusations or putting people on the defensive, just talking about my story and hoping mm -hmm. that that helps other people open up, or at least not even open up, just seek treatment if they need it or get help for people, um, or to understand the people in their lives, uh, because what you might think of somebody who isn't, you know, who's, who's kind of a jerk or, or, or who's kind of selfish or all these different, like, you know, personality traits, negative personality traits, could be dealing with something like this. and and. You know, to have to sort of dig deeper than the surface is is really important um, for me to get across to other people. Yeah. So the book, the book is about <laughs> yeah, just where I've been going through. Too cute to be crazy is is when I was, the first time I was hospitalized, um, the security guard actually said that to me. Uh, what are you doing in here? Too cute to be crazy, and I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, is there like a this is a beauty contest, you know what I mean? Like it's it 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 really kind of struck me and it stayed with me for, gosh, like five years now. Mm -hmm. um, this this idea that you can be too well put together to be going through something mentally um, is is you know one that I I definitely want to uh, destroy that myth. You're watching Left to Black. We've been joined by Bassy Ikpe. Bassy, what's your Twitter handle? Bassy World Live. And make sure to follow her there. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. We hope to have you on many times in the future. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.